listeners and welcome to another episode of Who Corner to Corner. My name is Paul and as always I'm joined by my jolly good tune, Mr. Jeff. Hi Jeff. Hi Paul, how are you today? Yeah, I'm very good sir, very good indeed and I'm incredibly excited because because we are joined by another Doctor Who luminary. We are. Uh, we are joined by the writer of, I don't want to put any pressure on you Stephen, but the writer of absolutely one of my all-time absolute 100% favourite stories of Doctor Who like ever, which yep. is of course... Terminus. No, Warrior's Gate. It's Warrior's Gate. So, Stephen, welcome to Who Corner Corner. Who Corner to Corner. Delighted to have you here. How are you? Oh, I'm I'm very well and happy to be out of the house. <laughs> What's the weather like where you are? It's it's rather sunny and slightly warm down here. Uh, it's sunny and lovely. We've got uh, we've got sheep in the field across the lane. So if you hear a banging and clanging in the in the background, that's that's them at the food shop. <laughs> so, well, they're building a new one in and in a whole kind of cityscape and everything else to go with it. Aren't they? The sheep have evolved, ladies and gentlemen. Brilliant. So thank you, Stephen, for for joining us. As I said, now we've got a whole bunch of questions which we're which we're going to ask you. Some of these, Jeff and I have kind of put our heads together and and come up with ourselves. But we also enlisted the help of some. Of our some of our loyal Twitter followers yep. as well to kind of pitch in because Warriors Gate I think is one of those stories which has a a very loyal kind of dedicated following. <laughs> I don't mean that in a scary sense, but you know it's it's a it's a it's a style of story which is which is really unique in the worlds of Doctor Who, and I don't think anything ever before or since has really kind of come close to it, but. We'll talk about that in a second, but what I would really like to know, and of course the fans are asking, um, is, is if you can take us back to the very start. Um, when, when did you decide to become a writer, and how did you go about doing it? Oh, we're talking about the age of about six yep. now. Um, when, uh, when, <laughs> I, when I first started uh, you know, writing stories for my parents, because yeah. I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't have school friends who could read. <laughs> and I remember the, the very first story yeah. I wrote was about a, a ghost going to ghost school uh -huh. and, uh, and not knowing yeah. the rules. And, uh, <laughs> and I drew the pictures and, and oh, everything. Wow. And, and for years, you know, I, I just kept doing the mm. same thing. And it was spotted by my, uh, my primary school teacher who, um, who um, I, my parents kept my school reports and I, uh, I was looking through them the other day. And, um, Actually, I was looking through my dad's because <laughs> I, I wanted something I could hold him to account over. And his were way worse than mine. But <laughs> but I would. My primary school teacher picked up on yeah. the fact that I had uh, an unusual talent for English, which is <laughs> counterbalanced by by uh, a terrible talent Oops. for maths. And nothing's <laughs> changed in that respect. So, uh, but he he kind of spotted that and encouraged mm. me. And I do remember that uh, while everybody else had um, had a rough book that um, once a week. You know, you had to write a little story in and people would write kind of two or three paragraphs mm. of a tale. And I was given a special separate book and I started a novel. <laughs> because why not? <laughs> why wouldn't you? I, I, I was about eight or nine by then and I just carried on with the, um, with, with the same story, you know, continuously mm. through. So, I mean, I, um, I look back and I'm, I'm grateful for the backing yeah. and the recognition that I got back then and the encouragement that I got because... Yeah, you know, every kid mm. needs encouragement, and it doesn't take a lot to kind of put you off, or uh, or if your peers don't uh, support you, or if they if they ridicule you for what you do. But the great thing about storytelling was that um, it kind of drew my peers in. Oh. So I would, you know, again, you know, still at mm. primary school, I was organising them for for plays, and we would put shows on, and um, and that kind of continued through secondary school mm. I remember I was uh, I was asked to write the teacher's pantomime one oh, year yeah. so uh, no, no, no. so all my bad carry on <laughs> jokes went into that and um, yeah writing for magazines yeah. from quite an early age I was submitting to magazines as well there was a there was a kids comic called uh, The Wizard right which was the last of the old story papers where the stories were purely prose with the occasional illustration as opposed to comic strips and I fastened on that quite early, and and I submitted to that. Um, drew my own pictures to go with it on lined mm. paper, completely unusable, <laughs> and the thing itself was was you know unpublishable. But I got yeah. this really nice reply from the editor saying, you know, keep at it. You know, we we can't use this one, but but do keep at it because uh, you know you obviously uh, you enjoy mm. it and you have a, a 
a, a, a bent for it. So, uh, and that you know was the foundation of the uh, of the whole thing. You know, I started and I've never stopped. Did did, did you get a story published in that in in, in that in the end in, in Wizard? No, I never did. The magazine it, it got absorbed into the Rover and um, became another yeah, comic strip yeah. magazine. I think they had one prose prose um, feature for a while but you know the days of uh, the old story papers were long gone but i did um, i did sign up for a magazine called collector's mm. digest which um via uh, sexton blake you know because i was um, a big sexton blake fan when i was a kid i used to buy the uh, the old paperbacks off uh, off the stall on eccles market second hand and there was an ad in the back of them for the um for the old boys book club the old boys and book club at the age of the old boys book Sounds yeah and grand. I was about 11 it does and it was it was all these people who in the yeah. kind of 20s and 30s had been readers of the magnet oh, and the right. gem yeah, you yeah, know yeah. the old Greyfriars stories and stuff like that and Sexton mm. Blake had been going since the 1890s as a back feature in a lot of these uh, these magazines so um so I joined up and and I bought some uh, some of the uh, the old um, issues from collectors who yeah. were advertising in the back of this. It was a Roneoed magazine, you know. It was it was an amateur magazine typed out and um, and gestetnered and and stapled and uh, and I've still oh, got really? the copies somewhere. Um, and and those copies that I bought, I bought some copies of the the Hapney Marvel and a comic called the dread norton boys war weekly from 1914 and when when about a decade ago i turned to doing a couple of historical novels they were the uh, the sources that i drew on and i tried to replicate the spirit of those gung-ho stories from from you know a century (laughs) ago but with a kind of yeah, modern yeah, sensibility, yeah. because obviously they were they were empire based, they were terribly racist, um, they were sexist, mm. and you know, everything that you could think of that could be wrong with them was wrong with them. But they did have a terrific kind of storytelling mm. mm. energy. So it kind of felt there as if I was coming full circle. Interesting. So, uh, and, and a lot of your stories have had a kind of supernatural or suspense or horror sci-fi kind of bent to them. Mm. Has, that, has that always been the case, or have you kind of? I, I know dabbled in various other things, but has the has the kind of genre stuff been been uh, a specific influence? And who's that? What you always wanted well, to it, write? You, your earliest stuff was about well, ghost school, there. So mm. yeah, maybe. Which yeah. Jeff likes. Jeff yeah, likes. Yeah, well, yeah. Stuff. I'm a, I'm yeah. A, <laughs> I quite often say, Stephen, on the, on the podcast, mm. I'd love a really good spooky Doctor mm. Who story. So that's yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's one of the things I really like. Yeah, oh, it's funny you mention that because um, my son-in-law was up um, at Christmas and he just picked up the uh, Sylvester McCoy set with oh, Ghost Light yeah, on it. Yeah. Mm. And and I hadn't seen Ghost Light, so we uh, we put it on, and I mm. absolutely yeah, loved yeah, it. Yeah. I thought it was great, and I, w- I was not um, um you know I was I was not really watching the show around mm. that time because I've. You know, I've I've had a long yeah, career indeed. and I've had a long association with Doctor Who, and I've dipped in and out over yeah. the years. I'm not I'm not part of core yeah. fandom, I've got to say. You know, and and anyone who is a true fan of Doctor Who can run rings around me <laughs> when it comes to you know the lore and the knowledge of the show. But I uh, I really love Ghostlight. Yeah. I thought it was yeah, terrific, and that I think kind of yeah that 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 ticks many mm. of the uh, of the spooky boxes yeah, that you yeah. were talking about but i did i i grew up reading science fiction and ghost stories and you know one of my earliest formative texts was the um the complete stories of h g okay. wells uh, in a big f- fat mm. volume published by ben and the funny thing is writers of my generation whenever i would go into their houses i would usually see one or other of the f- those formative books, whether it was the H.G. Wells complete short stories or the Professor Challenger stories, was another one. I would see them on their bookshelves mm. as well. That and the Dennis Gifford Guide to Horror Movies. <laughs> and and uh, I never heard of that. Right? And these were my formative yeah. influences. Yeah, you know that and Famous Monsters of Filmland, Mad Magazine, all that kind of thing. You know, swirling together. So when I started writing mm. professionally, um, I was like a kid in a toy shop. You know, uh, I do have this theory that we we start out by um, by writing what we mm, love, mm. and then we discover ourselves through that. You know, you you unconsciously um, or unintentionally add something of yourself along the way, and the trick is to spot out of what I've just mm. done. You know, what are my influences and what's me? Because what's me is the thing that is going to yeah, carry me yeah. forward. 
so yeah i was um you know i from 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 the from the get go i was i was doing science fiction i was doing horror and then i kind of discovered me in that and i didn't go away from the genre yeah. but i started suppressing the genre a little bit because i always remember in um in his book um on uh, on not the on writing book but the early one dance macabre right. stephen king which was a series of essays or lectures on on writing he he wrote about psycho and he was writing about the werewolf in fiction but he was offering um, norman bates as an example of the werewolf interesting and he said you know he doesn't mm. transform or anything but what you suspect is that norman bates is the werewolf on the inside all yeah. the time and i thought well that's terrific because it means you can write the monster mm. without having to write the monster <coughs> and so with books like kind of down river uh, rain nightmare with angel I didn't move out of horror, but I did move into crime and kind of took horror with me. Um, and I like to think that from that point onwards, I was mm -hmm. writing books that only, you know, a born horror writer could write, but they weren't necessarily horror yeah, genre. Yeah, yeah the, it's, it's quite interesting because I think with, with a lot of um, crime stories, I mean, you are delving into a very human horror, aren't mm. you? You're diving into the darkest mm part of, of human psyche and yeah. that's where all the monsters mm. live that's where the real monsters come from yep. and I think picking through the kind of the, the, the more sort of um, outrageous or you know the most obviously horror aspects of the genre inserting that into crime I think it can be really really effective mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, actually, you know, because the area is the mm. human subconscious, you know, which is the most fascinating and interesting area and I think that's where ultimately all yeah. art lives and uh, and in a book called October yeah. I um, I actually kind of made the human subconscious a territory you know into which our main character could cross and um and and in which you know the souls of the dead were still mm. waiting and and interacting with the souls of the living um that's about as overt as I ever got <laughs> but um, but yeah I mean and the other thing of course is that um you know kid in a toy shop mm. um I just wanted to play in mm. all media, you know, all all parts of the, uh, and I've I've kind of got away with it. You know, <laughs> I, I started in radio, yeah. and and then I uh, I did novels, and then I got into TV. I've written film screenplays, never had a feature film, and I don't yeah. regret that because writers get quite yeah. badly mm. treated in features. You know, you're you're quite disposable, and I have written for theatre, but not very well. <laughs> so I'll admit that straight up. Not very, but but I, I mean that, that's an extraordinary yeah. broad range of uh, media that mm. that that you've that mm. that you've been working in, isn't it? And you know mm. I think you know to to have enjoyed a a successful career where you can where you can play in a toy box that you and you know that 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 you love mm. so much is has got to be has got to be really something. And you know for, for for people sort of starting out on writing and and who want to make a career of it, is there any sort of advice that you might? Any nuggets of um, wisdom, if you like, which you could which you could provide? It's tricky because it's a different mm. world to yeah. to when I started out. I um, I was um, I was starting out at a time when you could you could write a script and send mm. it to um, the editor of Saturday Night Theatre at Radio Four and get an invite down and a tour of the studios <coughs> and a commission out of it, which is well, what yeah. I got. And this was without you know much in the way of prior experience at all but prior to that i had got together with mm, mates mm. and uh, we'd done a um a series for independent local radio we all had kind of you know <laughs> a particular set of skills <laughs> that we all put together you know there were there were some actors there was um there was a commercial a radio commercials mm. producer there was a, a radio dj who could operate the desk and me with my you know very kind of rudimentary and early writing talent we all got together and we made this show and i suppose the um, the advice i would have to give was get together with your peers and do something <coughs> and then on the basis of that that mm. gives you a platform to launch into whatever else the world is offering at that time you know whatever mm. opportunities are being offered because the opportunities that were there for me are not the opportunities that are there yeah. today and the opportunities that are there today are not necessarily opportunities that i could take yeah. you know they um you know i am I, I've been in this business quite a long time, and I think I've been in it. I've I've managed in it for long enough that I can say I've sort of, you know, I've pulled it off. <laughs> if it was taken away from me today, I could still say, well, yeah, yeah but yeah, I've still yeah. won. You, you, there, there's you know? a body so, of work uh, yeah. in, in your yeah, in, you, in your you, training. Yeah. You've got a career in it. Yeah, yeah, and that, 
you know, that's the body of work that if I started again mm -hmm. right now, you know, give me the youth and give me the energy, I couldn't replicate yeah. it. I would be doing something else yeah. altogether. So that's kind of then, this is now. But I would say getting, and it's easier But it's in many you know, ways. It's easier to get yeah, together with your you, mates you can and do just, something. You know, if you want to make films, use your phone, you know, or you can, you can write yeah. on your iPad and, you know, mm. yeah, there's the, it, it is easier in many ways to, to, to do stuff, but to, to, to get yeah. a scene and to, you know, there's, there's more competition in some ways. Like you said, you know, the way things work for you, uh, it's, mm. it's different these days. And, yeah, I'm, my advice to, you know, to, to film filmmakers is just get out there and do it. Get together with your friends, get yeah. out there and do it. Mm. Because if you don't, yeah. you, you're, you're never taking that chance and you'll never get any opportunities mm. if you just, you know, continue to be an aspiring filmmaker, you know, as you often mm. see online and, mm. uh, you know, want to be writer and things. So just get out there and do it, you know. That's how Shane Meadows did it. You know, he he got together mm. with mates, and uh, and this was in you know this was at a point mm. where um, I think the earliest um, you know handy cams were uh, yeah. were coming into the market. When I was uh, when I was kicking off, then it was like Super Eight, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you know it, most of it was silence. The great thing about that, of course, was that you could do something and not be very good at it. And yeah. nobody could see <laughs> yeah. it because you, you, you know. Didn't feel <laughs> whereas <in> now, <laughs> whereas now, if you do something and it's not very good, you know, you yeah. put it out there proudly, and the yeah. whole world sees it, and, and everyone's and then, got an opinion on then it. Then you have well. that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Watch let you know it. <laughs> so there is a disadvantage <laughs> yes, as, w as yeah. well as an advantage <laughs> to uh, to all of that. <laughs> I mean, my uh, my calling card for quite yeah. a while was a, a terrible 16 millimeter film that I'd made, and what was impressive was the fact that I'd made a film in 16 yeah, yeah. mil, not yeah. the film itself, because nobody ever yeah. saw the <laughs> film, you know, because uh, <laughs> they weren't going to thread up a projector yeah. and sit and watch it. But oh, you know, this guy's done 16 yeah. mil; he must be at a certain uh, certain level of competence. That? Not true. <laughs> but, you know. I, I, I had that many years ago, and I made a film as well, and it was a you know an hour long film and. You know, people didn't, they didn't mm. watch it, you know, I'd send DVD copies out, but it mm. was exactly like you just said, Stephen, the fact that I'd done something, mm. you know, and written mm. it and produced it and, you know, the whole thing, and that then opened some mm. doors for me, because people could see mm. that you were serious about it and, and committed to it, so, yeah, it, it's mm. get out there and do it, yeah. I mean, we've all got that mate who'll tell you the story of, you know, how, you know, he would have been a filmmaker now if it wasn't for the yeah, fact yeah, that, yeah. Uh, you know, somebody did him down at some point or somebody yeah. didn't turn up. And the thing is, yeah, that f knockbacks on a daily yeah. basis, apart yeah, from you know, yeah. every knockback. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, you know, the, the advice I always give is, yeah, you've got to learn yeah. to bounce, yeah. you know, bounce back yeah. from everything. Take everything that bad that happens mm. to you and see what opportunity yeah. lies in it, because... I had one of these questions the other day, you know, if you were, if you could go back again and, you know, tell your yeah. young self or warn your young self of something, what would you do? And I said nothing. I would not mm. change a thing because every good experience I've had has been somehow a consequence of every yeah. bad experience I've had. You know, every single one has, every bad experience has led to a good one, either by denying me an opportunity that would have taken me down a different road or by opening mm. up an opportunity that, um, that yeah, I never expected. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's an interesting one, but I think you're right. I think it's it's go out and mm -hmm. do it and be resilient, mm -hmm. grow a thick skin because mm -hmm. you are going to take some some mm -hmm. negatives, some knockbacks, as you yeah. said. <laughs> but just go out and do it. I think that's mm -hmm. the that, that's the biggest thing, isn't it? Yeah, I was talking to a producer yesterday mm -hmm. about um, a, a project that we started in 2014, and which has been on and off and knockback and. Uh, Covid was, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. lockdown was the biggest knockback for it. We were about to board a plane to New Zealand to scout locations in May 2020, wow. and we all know what happened yes, in New Zealand in yeah. May 2020. Mm. Yeah, they they closed. So the whole thing kind of died on its ass and has recently just um, just just raised right. itself again. Um, and you know, again, it's it's a case of bounce back. The thing, you know, the thing itself has evolved yeah, hugely yeah. in that time. But it's it's active again, and I said to him, you know, the um, the point of all this is you've got to enjoy the process. You know, I have enjoyed the last you know nine years or whatever mm. it is of working on this, you know, pushing it along a bit, coming up with ideas to push it along, making new contacts, having great lunches, <laughs> you know, great boozy lunches down in <laughs> always important <laughs> down in uh, yeah. the headquarters, and uh, yeah, and. Yeah, you've got to enjoy that mm. process because if all you live for is the end result, 
then you know you're <laughs> you're spending yeah. most of your life on tent hooks and, mm. and unhappy. If it's only the end result that's going to make you happy, whereas I actually love the whole mm. process from start to finish, and I've I've enjoyed myself as much on projects that didn't get made, almost as much as as on the ones that do. Yeah. Although, of course, you know when the thing does get made, then that <laughs> takes it over into yeah. a certain other we'll, territory. We'll, we'll so come to that. Let's not talk that <laughs> we'll down. Come to that in yeah. a second. <laughs> so, so going mm. back to Doctor Who, then I mean, you kind of mentioned that you you know mm. you, you wouldn't call yourself a massive core fan or anything like that. Would you, you know, it's, it's okay. We we can forgive that. But yeah. you <laughs> you must have been aware of Doctor Who before you got the commission to write Warriors Gate. You know, so so what are your sort of earliest memories of uh, of Doctor Who? Oh God, yeah. A viewer from the Hartnell mm. years, you know, I um, I um, I used to go up to my grandmother's place because she had a TV that could get BBC. Uh, I was going to say BBC One, it was but just, it was just BBC, the wasn't BBC it? Yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and uh, and you know the um, word had gone round the playground that there was this fantastic new show that everybody was everybody was doing Daleks. There was no kind of buzz about yeah. Doctor Who until the really? Daleks yeah, yeah. came along, um, and um, and then suddenly you know it was. Oh my God! What's this? What's this show? Got to get to Grandma's and see it. <laughs> and then, uh, then I persuaded my dad to jerry rig the TV yeah. we had at home to uh, to get BBC One because it had a faulty switch on it and it would only get my <laughs> <Right>, TV. <okay. laughs> you poor soul. <laughs> yeah. Ju- the, yes. the, uh, we was poor, but yeah. we was honest. <laughs> <laughs> was it one of those dial, dial TVs? Did, 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 did you have one of those? We used to have one of them actually. It had a. Ca- so it wasn't like a. Yeah, button. It was I mean, like you tune it, would, it in like yeah, a radio yeah. on, a, on, a, on an old dial or something. Yeah, it had kind of um, clicky um, positions, yeah, and the yeah, clicky position yeah. for for BBC One didn't work. <laughs> so my dad had to he had to sculpt a pencil to jam the switch into the right place for for BBC One. <laughs> That's creative, isn't it? Oh, the BBC, the BBC, I should yes, say. the British Broadcasting <laughs> Corporation. <laughs> Kids today don't realise how, how easy they've got it, do they? Oh, they've got it easy, Jeff. Yeah. They oh, they don't yeah. even have to press buttons each day. <laughs> just swipe it on and out, don't they? That's all they've got to do, mate. I will tell you. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> all that, and then I was yeah. looking at the uh, at the TV last night and thinking, mm, you know, picture's not as good as an OLED. <laughs> Shall I? Is it time to upgrade? <laughs> <laughs> Is it indeed? So, so how how did the um, commission for Warriors Gate come about then? Because uh, you you were you've been professionally published at that time, hadn't you? I think you were a recognised uh, talent, so to speak. Well, I was I was off the ground. Mm. Yeah, I've been. Uh, I think by then I'd published Chimera. Um, I'd certainly published um, tie-in novels with the radio serials that yes. I'd done at uh, mm. independent local radio, and I'd done a string of Saturday night theatres for BBC Radio Four. Um, and the the li- latest one of them was a thing called Alternative, an alternative to suicide, okay. which was a science mm. fiction play, uh, and the lead in that was played by Michael Jaston. Oh, okay. Uh, Oh, and it was great because I got to meet up again with Michael at um, at um, yeah, Gallifrey yeah, One yeah. in Cause, Los cause Angeles. He played the Valiard, didn't Not he? last year, but the year before. Mm. That's right, yeah. Uh, and that was terrific. And Martin Jenkins, who was the producer of uh, of mm. the radio play, sent the script over to the Doctor Who office and said, "You should be taking a look at this guy." So I got a call to uh, to go in and uh, and have a meeting with Chris mm. Bidmead, who you know introduced me to uh, to John Nathan Turner. And I got introduced to Tom, yeah. um, who uh, who was passing through the building. This was Threshold House on uh, on uh, right, Shepherd's yeah, Bush yeah, Green, yeah. which was the most unsalubrious <laughs> <That's> and, <laughs> uh, and <laughs> uncreative feeling office block that you block poss- possibly could London. imagine. <laughs> It was like kind of 1950s East Germany. In, in Brutalist there. architecture. And, um, yeah. But out of that came, uh, you know, they, they Chris mm. asked me to do... Uh, some pictures so I came up with a story uh, called at the time mm. the dream time um, and that became Warriors Gate and what I had to do was uh, was mesh my concept with the whole kind of East yeah. space where they were in the mm. season which actually worked really well because the dream time was all about crossing through mm, yeah, barriers yeah. into you know mm. another form of reality which is where the white space came from um, in in uh, in Warriors. Avoid. So, yeah, on the basis of, of a one-page mm. um, pitch, which just had four paragraphs, one paragraph per half hour, um, I got commissioned to do a treatment, which was an expanded version yeah. of that. And on the basis of the treatment, I, I got launched to script. Yeah. 
as they say. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, mm. was it quite prescriptive in some ways in that? So, sorry, what, what I mean is, did, did you have the shopping list of, uh, right, so it's got the end space, e space, you know, the end of that kind of trilogy. We've got uh, Romana, mm. the Doctor's companion, leaving. We've got to get rid of K9. And we've somehow mm. got a, you know, we've got a new companion, Adric, who was only introduced a couple of stories ago. So we don't know much about his, you know, about who he is and all the rest mm. of it. And we've also got to boot the Doctor back into the normal universe. Was, was that shopping list there from the outset, or did, was, was that kind of thrown at you as it went That out? was exactly it. No, you've you've said it exactly. That was, I, uh, I've made the uh, the mm. comparison before of like you know there is a big empty room and with a door at either end and you walk in through one door and you walk out yeah. through the other and when you walk <laughs> in through the <laughs> the entrance good. you're handed a certain yeah. amount of luggage and when you go out the other door you have to have a certain amount of different <laughs> luggage with you and how you swap the <laughs> luggage in between times is entirely up to you. As long as you know you you pick up what you're uh, you're given to start with and you hand over what you have to hand over yeah. at the end, so um, and it, it, that was great because you know you need something to mm. to play against. You know it's like it's like playing squash. You need a wall to uh, to bounce I things like off. That. Yes. So um, yeah. So so my large room analogy here is uh, is being stretched a little bit. So it's now a squash court. <laughs> Again, <laughs> an example of how these things evolve. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it, it gives you, you know, it gives you things yeah. to work with, and it gives you things to spark your imagination. You know, the, there is nothing worse than just being told, "Oh, do mm, anything." Mm. You know, what do yeah. you want from me? Oh, we want yeah. anything. You know, and you're staring but, uh, at a blank page. But I mean, Brian Clemens, who yeah. I, yeah, Clemens, who I used to, um, I, who I, who I got to work with later in life, um, when he was working for the Danziger brothers on kind of quota quickies in the mm. 1950s, they would have a bunch of sets and some props and a couple of actors with a little bit left on their contracts. And they would say to Brian Clemens, look, you know, we've got, we've got Dermot Walsh and Hazel Court for, uh, for yeah. eight days. Um, we've got a courtroom set and we've got a submarine. Can, Can you, you do us something <laughs> around that? So, uh, and Clemens would go off and do it. And, you know, Clemens, I've got to say, is my writing hero. Um, and it was uh, a huge honor for me to, um, to, to share mm. a credits screen with him on Bugs. And, uh, and you know, to, uh, he wrote the introduction to my first collection of short stories mm. as well. Um, and that I learned, you know, quite early on yeah. from, uh, well, from the likes of him uh, to, um, you know, to juggle with what you've got and to try and make magic with it. Yeah, yeah. So the, the process from script to screen in Warriors Gate, by, by all accounts, seems to have been um, slightly difficult. I'm trying to find a polite way to put it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, from a production perspective, as, as much as anything else, you know, with, with Paul Joyce kind of getting fired and rehired and, you know, all kinds of shenanigans mm -hmm. going on there. Mm -hmm. What was it like mm -hmm. from your experience? So, so this was your first TV script, wasn't it, I think? It was, so yes. What, how yeah. did it... Uh, and yeah. the last yeah. for a while as well. <laughs> the sky you for life in some yeah. <laughs> Was it an interesting learning experience? Yeah. It was. I mean, it, it wasn't that horrendous for me because I wrote and mm. I rewrote and I rewrote. You know, I got notes and I rewrote and then finally handed the thing over. And all of the, um, all of the, the crap hitting the fan happened from that yeah, point yeah. onwards. Yeah. So... And, and this is the thing about you know being a, a writer in British mm. TV at that time, and to a certain extent, it's it still persists to this day. Is that you're an outsider mm. to the production process. You're a piece worker, who from whom they buy the mm. story, and then they do their thing with it. And um, what had happened with uh, with me was I'd, I'd you know I'd got continuous feedback and notes from Chris. I'd done several yeah. drafts, and. My understanding was that the last one that I handed in was ready to go to uh, to the so, yeah, studio yeah. floor. It wasn't <laughs> because, bear in mind, you know, my my experience before this had been yeah. in radio, and the sensibility of a radio script and a TV script. A TV script, they ask very mm. little of you. You know, the page asks very little of you. The least you can put on the page, the better it is. Um, so the world building that I was used to in radio was too much yeah, for a TV yeah. script. So after it left my hands and I thought everything was fine, Paul and Chris, you know, Paul Joyce, Chris Bidmead, between mm. them kind of took it to pieces and reassembled it as a shooting script, um, which <coughs> at first glance I barely mm. recognised. In the meantime, of course, I'd gone off and written the novelisation. Oh, right, you'd, you'd already done that, by <laughs> 
Yeah. I'd done that. Yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, I, I was quite young and I was full of energy. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be quite so quick off the mark <laughs> now. But bang, bang, bang. You know, the uh, the stuff was coming out. So what then happened was that we had kind of two distinct mm. versions of Warriors Gate, um, and production office, mainly in the person of John Nathan Turner, wouldn't okay the novelization oh, in its current form yeah. because. The TV script had been, you know, rearranged to a great extent. So I then had to um, do a, a massacre mm. job on my own manuscript to make the novelization right. conform more to the TV version. And as a result of that, this kind of myth of the lost version mm. of the novelization <laughs> took hold. Not encouraged by me to any great extent, at least not until <laughs> later yeah, years yeah. when I realized it was <laughs> a thing. But... Um, Unfortunately, I'd kept all the bits, <laughs> so so the uh, the idea of reconstructing yeah. the lost novelization was never sort of it was never out of the mm. question. But I was rather hoping that somebody else would do it. <laughs> and and, I, <laughs> and after about thirty years, I bit the bullet yeah, and did yeah, it myself. Yeah. So uh, so that's how we have the uh, the republication uh, today. But yeah. all of the uh, all of the you know the the production stuff, it went on after it left mm. my hands so other people suffered <laughs> uh, way more than than i did i d i was just miffed yeah. when i kind of saw how little of what mm. i'd done actually made it into uh, onto yeah. the screen uh and i was miffed for a little while and i was i was quite prickly if if the subject mm. came up and then as the years went by of course and i had other credits to my name and i had a career elsewhere and doctor who was yeah, not the only yeah. thing that I could hope to be known for then it kind of fell in, into perspective and I became a lot more sanguine yeah. about the whole thing to the extent that I'm so laid back <laughs> these days that you have to you have to prod me to make is sure I'm still awake. there is he still <laughs> going wake, wake up <laughs> yeah. I, I remember I remember reading an interview with you and I think it was in 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 a magazine called Interzone which was a, a short a collection of sci-fi short stories I, I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that but um I, I know Oh, I, I, do, I remember yeah. reading it, and I, th I thought, "Oh my goodness, it sounds it sounds horrific." Because I think I think the interview was all focused on on the negative stuff, and it, it, you know, and it was it, and it was quite. I think it was quite close to the production mm. time as well. So it might have been when you were more prickly towards it. And I think the interview had obviously kind of pulled that out and made this great this great feature of it. But mm. it, it was an interesting eye opener into you know into into how a script can change so much from what it is. But the thing that got me when I you know when I sort of came to it a bit later on and uh, understood a bit more about the you know they like like you were saying about Chris Bidmead and Paul Joy sort of going away and reworking it but clearly they were really excited by and and and, and seemed to get creatively inspired by by what you'd originally written so it's almost like they kind of took it off in yeah took it off in their own sort of direction but still using everything that you that you'd given them so it kind of breathes a, its its own life in a way Oh, they did a terrific job, and you know, once the indignation years were <laughs> the over, indignation then, then I could recognise that. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, from 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 the perspective of today, mm. yeah, yeah, you know, ev everybody involved deserves all the credit they deserve, you know. And um, I recently did, um, and I'm not quite sure when this will be coming out, but I recently did um, a commentary. Uh, with uh, with Matthew Waterhouse oh, yes. and, okay. uh, and with and with yeah. Graham um, on this, and it'll be out on a, a DVD that you can either watch along with the show or you can just listen to Ooh. it. You know, as, oh, a, as an audio that. thing. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and some of the uh, the the sort of backstory mm. that other people knew that I didn't uh, came out, and that's so I learned a lot in the course of that. Yeah, it's interesting because it? again, it's a creative thing of, of so many people, isn't it? You, yeah. you know, obviously the director and, and Chris Bidmead and the actors mm. doing their thing, and the lighting guys, cameras, and and, and everything else. Mm. And it's I must say, it's one of those things where I mean, for me personally, Warriors Gate was um, one of those stories that, I mean, I, I again, I'd been aware of Doctor Who, I'd, I'd read a whole load of Target novels, you know, when I was when I was at primary school and sort of junior school growing up, and, and I'd seen a bit of Doctor Who through the 70s, but when I, but when, when, when this season, which is season 18, came out, my dad always switched over the TV to watch Buck Rogers and specifically Wilma Deering, <laughs> so, you know, which is very kind of, Eric yeah, exactly, which is all very kind of <laughs> glamorous and Exciting and flashbang whistles, mm -hmm. and then on the other side, you've got you've got Warriors mm -hmm. Gate, you know, which looks so different mm -hmm. to anything like that. But for me mm -hmm. personally, when when I I think I, I maybe caught episode 
two or three or something, so I hadn't seen it from the start. But I remember being absolutely mm. entranced by what I was seeing mm. on TV because the mm. visual aspect, mm. you know, rather than the actual mm. story or any of the sort of hard mm. concepts underneath it, was, was what really grabbed mm. my attention. And the idea of that mm. kind of almost, you know, that really surreal a juxtaposition of you know the privateer spaceship the police box mm. TARDIS and this this gate this this gothic arch in the middle of a white void yeah. was just I, I mean I, I was just absolutely I was more excited by that mm. than Erin Gray if I'd have been a few years older <laughs> that might have been slightly different <laughs> but for me as a yeah. very raw 10 year old at that at that time it was it was mm. astonishing and that sort of began or boosted my kind of engagement with with the program thereafter because I thought well now I'm going to really really sit down and watch it you know because I'd, I'd only mm. ever caught things and I wasn't you know, sort of subscribe to it. So, so Warriors Gate really gave me the kind of boost of that. For, and for such a, a concept-heavy story, whether it's in print or on screen, you know, it's mm. it, it, you, you kind of think that would be quite unusual, perhaps in some ways. But it did, and I know from engaging with other fans that I'm, I'm not alone in that respect. <laughs> you know, there are there are yeah. others like that. So, sorry, I just had to say that because you know, it's, oh, thank you, thank it's, you. It's quite yeah. a, an influential story on on me, if you like. You know, yeah. so. Um, yeah, and it's it's the product of all the talents that went into it, not just mm. me. I mean, uh, and, and in places where maybe you know it doesn't immediately make obvious sense because you know the logic is there, but it's not um, easy yeah, to you grasp. Have to work at it it don't does you? make a. But I love I love that, and it makes a poetic mm. sense all the way through. Um, and and that is you know it's a combination of sound, vision, mm, yeah. concept, choices. Mm. You know everything everything kind of works together, and. At the time, you know, it wasn't huge. It wasn't well mm. loved. I don't think in the very early days. I mean, I didn't get a lot of fan feedback um, then because I'd, I'd kind of, you know, moved yeah. onward. Um, but its reputation seems to have mm. grown and grown mm. since, mm. Um, and it has far higher standing now than um, than it than it did, you know, when it first went very out. Very possibly, yeah. You know, and I think it's. Um, I mean, for me again, it's like. I, I liken it to um, the, the Blade Runner movie and the novelization Do mm. Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. They're two very distinct mm -hmm. beasts, you know, they're, they're two very distinct products, if you like, about the same themes. They mm. cover exactly the same themes mm. and they have the same mm. sort of characters and things happen, you know, the incidents are approximately mm. the same, but there are obvious differences. Mm. But when you mm. but when you look at them, they are they they come across as very different. You know, they, the book is way more nihilistic even than the movie. And the movie's quite nihilistic, <laughs> but it's actually quite optimistic yeah. in in its way. But they deal with the same thing. Good and old then Phil. When you, yeah. But then when you bring the two together, so you read the book and you watch the movie, and it's exactly the same with Warriors mm. Gate. You you read the book of Warriors mm. Gate and you watch a TV series, and the two mm. kind of combine to create a third piece, mm. which takes the you know it takes everything from both because, I mean, I I remember. Um, reading the original Warriors Gate novel years ago, and 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 actually, when I got to watching the TV series again later on, I thought I'd remembered stuff from the TV series, but actually, it's from the book. But what I'd learned from the book, mm. and specifically the stuff about the flipping of the coin mm. and how it kind of taps into or, or represents a, a sample of the you know the sort of patterns in the universe, which mm. we might call random, but which aren't random, mm. but we can it, they only seem to be random because we can't see the full scale model that they dip into. But then mm. with eSpace being a much smaller universe, you know, it's much easier to kind of rep oh, ah, I loved all that stuff. You know? So <laughs> I, I'm just going to for a minute because I can. Just <laughs> but that's it. it's like you know the, the thinking behind it as well. Yeah, I mean, I love Doctor Who for its humour and its outrageousness, and quite often for its campness and you know, and it's you know, and all of that stuff. But when it gets really cerebral, like in Warriors Gate and Ghostlight, like you mentioned as well. And you know stories like mm. that. I I just I, you know I could watch them over and over and over and over. They're the ones that really get me. But I understand you know for some fans it's 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 mm. not what they're after. And the great thing about Doctor Who, of course, it, it can take it, all it of can those do ideas. Do all can't of it? it, yeah, yeah. Oh, indeed, yeah. I mean, it is the ultimate kind of um, do anything, yeah, go anywhere really show. Mm. All it's you need is your police box, your Doctor, a human or other companion for the Doctor to bounce yeah. off. And you know somewhere yeah. for them to go, and it can be anywhere in human history. It can mm. be anywhere in the universe. Yeah, oh, creatively unlimited. In any other universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it always comes back mm. to you know the same point where you know where, when you go out the door at the other side of the big room, you know you've got the doctor, yeah. <laughs> somebody to bounce off, and uh, and, and, and and the and police. I love what you went into it with, and if you come out with yeah. something else, yeah. Mm. Um, the, there's a, a question here. 
Uh, so Warriors Gate was published under the pen name of John mm. Lydecker. So uh, and Terminus mm. as well. Where did that come? That name come from? All oh, right, I, I get asked right, this okay. a lot. Sorry. So, so <laughs> you know, if you're listening to this, forgive me if I if I give the same explanation again. But um, the reason for doing it mm. in the first place was because I wanted to kind of. Um, distinguish between my novel writing and my um, novelization right. writing because the two mm. are very different forms. The novelization I just saw as a commercial thing which was beholden to the thing it was based on whereas a novel is you know, an expression of the, the novelist's own creativity yeah. to put it a bit poncily. <laughs> but that's why I did it and um, I took the name Lidecker, John Lidecker from I took it from the um, the radio play, an alternative to suicide, which had oh, got me the right. um, the gig in yeah. the first place. And for that, I took it from Howard and Theodore Lidecker, who were the two brothers who worked for Republic Serials in the 1940s, oh. doing the special yeah. effects that made Captain Marvel oh. fly. And then yeah. in the 1960s, they worked on Irwin Allen TV shows. So they were the ones who uh, who did the Sea View in Bottom of the Voice to the Bottom of the Sea. Brilliant. So the Lidecker brothers gave me the name for the radio mm -hmm. play so and I took that, the yeah. name from the radio play for novelising. And I did a couple of other things mm -hmm. under the Lidecker name and then <laughs> I reached the point where I thought, I'll just stop So I stopped doing it. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> it's a great story. Good, good intention, yeah. though. Yeah. I, I didn't, do you know what? I've never heard yeah. that story before. So for me, at least, it's brand yeah, no, new. I didn't. So well, I there you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Paul, we had a, a couple of questions uh, from Mark Lynch on Twitter, didn't we? He, he actually asked that mm. one, didn't he? But uh, what was his other one that he asked? His other one was, hold on a second, let me find it. Right, so he says, he says, ah, yes, okay, so Mark's questions. Um, um, he asks, do you believe a novelisation should enlarge on the filmed or televised manuscripts. So again, going back to what you're saying about John Nathan Turner, maybe mm. not, not signing off the original version he did. Mm. And also the second question is, Warriors Gate sees the first appearance of the Tharrells. Are you sad that they've not appeared in Doctor Who since? Well, hello, Mark. Yeah, and uh, and I suspect you may know the answer to this already because we follow each other on Twitter. Uh, but uh, but yes, I do believe that uh, a novelization is is something that should expand mm. upon and and provide extra dimensions to and provide a kind of interior experience, which which the TV doesn't. You know, the TV is something you observe, whereas the uh, the novelization is something you experience. Mm. When I was a kid, I was a big fan of um, a writer called John Burke who seemed to get all the novelising gigs that were going at the time. And I remember his novelizations of the champions. Oh, there was a guy called Peter Leslie who ghosted a couple of Avengers mm. novelizations that went out under Patrick McNee's name. And the really, really good ones that stuck with me were the ones that added to the experience of the TV. They weren't just a record of it. I mean, bear in mind that this was pre-VHS, pre yeah any other way of yeah, re-experiencing yeah. a show that you loved so the novelizations were more or less the only way that you could kind of keep that mm. sense of connection but even so it was always a big thrill when you when you got into a novelization where it took you a bit further than mm. the the tv had ever done so yeah i do believe that and that's why i was a bit dismayed when uh, when jnt wouldn't okay mm. the novelization because of the very um, experience that you just described, I was trying to bring that mm. to uh, to the reader, something that went above and beyond the TV show and complemented the TV show. Uh, and when you put the two together, were a bigger mm. experience than just either of them on its on on its own. That's one of the big big and, things. Um, so, sorry, of, of the target books, isn't it? They always expand mm. and, and mm. deepen the stories. And, well, they, they know, don't always. That that's the thing. Some oh, do, really? some don't. A mm, lot right. of them are literally just straight copies, which you know is another thing entirely, I suppose. But you know, I suppose it's um, w which is best. Now, I, I kind of go with, with 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 what you're saying, Stephen. It's that you know it, it allows for a greater experience. Mm, you yeah, know, one that gives you mm. an alternative to just watching it on the TV and which actually when you do watch it with the TV brings the whole thing together yeah yeah it moves off the screen and inside mm. your head and the second part of Mark's question did I uh, you know was 
did I wish more had been done with the Tharrells? Well, I'll tell you what really annoyed me. In fact, I never, never got an action figure. No! You know, <laughs> sort that out right now, character options. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you see, I've, 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 I've raised my game mm. now because I don't just want to see an action figure. I want to see a chess set. Ooh. You know, oh, with, that would be good. With Tharrells and, yeah, and yeah, Gundams. Yeah. 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 And and all the pawns are human. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have R- Rolvik's <laughs> Rolvik's crew as there as, as, as a, some some people in there, couldn't they? Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. Gundam Tharrells. <laughs> yeah, so there yeah. you go. Yeah, but no, but yeah, um, you know, and and I think this is a loaded question from Mark because Mark knows <laughs> full well that, that that Cutaway Comics are now Indeed. doing um, Faustine Princess mm. of Tharrell, which you can probably see the cover yes, on the uh, on the wall yeah. behind yeah. me here. It's well. It's, it's not the the finished cover. That's that's the kind of preliminary mm. ad from Martin Garrity's right. art. But um, but yeah, I mean that's that's coming out around the same time as the novelisation. And th- and I don't know if you know the situation, but um, prior to New mm. Who, um, when w- in Classic Who, all the writers who who contributed got to keep the copyrights of anything that they right. brought in. So if you created a villain or you created a character. Uh, mm. For Doctor Who, you kept the copyright in that because the BBC could not be asked to do a deal <laughs> over it because they thought it wasn't important. Yeah. <laughs> they think differently yeah, I now. They I've do, got yeah. to say, but <laughs> uh, yeah. But this is how Terry Nation kept the Daleks, yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know, K9 is is owned by uh, by Bob yeah. Baker Dave and, Miles, um, Dave and the Cybermen. Yeah, yeah. So they had to do um, they had to do deals with the creators in order to bring them back from New Who. I never got uh, I never got approached for 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 Tharrells or Gundams mm. or anything, so so that never became an issue. But uh, Gareth Kavanagh, who um, who who he used he was the landlord of the Lasser Gowry pub in Manchester, okay. yeah. um, and um, he used to run Doctor Who events there, and it became a kind of hub for Doctor Who fandom in Manchester, and it was a glorious time. I went to a few things that uh, that he put on there, and. Eventually, he was so successful that the brewery booted him out. <laughs> but Gareth, being <laughs> Gareth, being yeah. Gareth, he um, he he was looking for new ventures and he organised a few things. And his latest thing is is a comics company, mm. Cutaway Comics, where he approached you know several of the uh, the yeah, creators yeah. of yeah. Uh, of Classic Who, me included, and said, "Would you like to expand upon you know your particular owned part mm. of the um, of the the expanded universe?" And I said, "Okay." So I came up with uh, with Faustine. Mm. Don't know where the name came from. Um, just sort of seemed to be there, waiting to uh, to be discovered. Uh, and she's a female Tharrell, and she is snatched from the uh, the gateway, um, and is an experimental subject in the Human Rebellion, okay. which is re- yeah. referred to in the uh, because at one point um, Tharrells kept humans yeah, as slaves. Yeah, yeah. The humans created the Gundans with their their armor of dwarf star mm. alloy, which allowed them to subjugate the Tharrells and make them slaves yeah, in so return. Kind of the whole which thing. is the situation that uh, the situation we start Warriors Gate with, you know, because the uh, the privateer is a mm. slave ship with with a hold full of uh, of enslaved Tharrells, and we have back references in Warriors Gate too. You know, and we see little snatches of it through the gateway of the the human yeah. uprising, and so all of this is taking place. You know, the comic story is taking place kind of off stage during the human uprising in uh, in Warrior's Gate. It's a little bit like that um, that Star Trek Next Generation story where they intercut a present day story with the trouble with Tribbles. Yes, and yeah. <laughs> and they had they, they had footage from the uh, the original. And new footage of what was happening just That's around right. yeah, the corner yeah, yeah, yeah. with the people who you couldn't see in the. Well, we don't have the original, yeah, but yeah. we just have. <laughs> yeah, we just have this. We just have the stuff that I own. Yes, that's brilliant. I, I mean, I must admit, actually, just on the side there, I, I love those cutaway comics. I've, I've, I've got a few. Mm. I've got um, this one here, which is Litten, uh, using Eric Saber. Oh yes, characters. yeah, that's that's Eric. There's, yeah, there's a few more as well, mm. and I would recommend to anybody go out and get them because they are absolutely mm. brilliant, and I will mm. definitely be getting. Faustine as well because I think there, there's a lot to be told about the Tharrells mm. you know and like, like you're saying but you know there, there's a lot of conflict in that particular part of their mm. story isn't there with the, 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 the uprising and the, the switch of, of 
you know, the whole slave and the master's kind of role. And actually thinking about that, this is another mm. theme in Warriors games, which I hadn't thought mm-hmm. of, but there's an awful lot of inversions of those types of reversals, isn't there? Because, I mean, even just using the, mm. the, the physical aspects of the mirrors and, and travelling through the mirrors, you know, and, oh, my God, it's brilliant. Honestly, it's just, <laughs> the more I think about this, it's <laughs> such a good story. <laughs> ah, go off, man, but keep to the script, Paul, keep to the script. No, it's fine. <laughs> So, so that's out very shortly, is it, Faustine? It is, it is. It's at the, it's at the printers now, mm. and um, it was done as a Kickstarter, so there are various things that need to be assembled for the, the stretch mm. goals because we, we went way beyond the, um, the target, so, so we've now got to deliver on the stretch goals. One of the stretch goals, as I recall, was um, if you went in for one of the, the levels, you will get um, the scripts, Ooh. The, the, the original scripts. Yeah that went off from me before before um Chris and Paul did their thing on them so you'd be able to mm. to do your own um academic investigation of uh, of what the differences are uh and the 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 disc I was talking about before where uh, where Graham Harper and uh, and Matthew Warshouse yeah. and I talked through all the episodes um and Graham sort of explains exactly what his role in supporting Paul in the direction yeah, was yeah, um of course that's going to be one of the extras as well right. that comes along with Faustine. So, um, so you'll be able to, uh, to sort of that's catch fantastic. up with that. And, that. and that's on the, the Kickstarter yeah. page, is it? Have we got a link to that somewhere? Um, y- yeah. I'm, 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 I'm just looking at their website on. now, actually. But I think they're, they're pushing at getting it out yeah. there. So there are no details up at the moment because we don't know quite how soon we'll be able to, uh, to deliver on that. But yeah. um, on the original Kickstarter page, you've got all that stuff. Um, and I, I just heard from Gareth yesterday. Yeah. It's there were there were a couple of things, a couple of setbacks with you know sort of a bit of illness on, along the way from people who were contributing mm. to it that just held us up a couple of months. Otherwise, it would have been out last mm. year. But uh, but everything is is done and on right. course now, and uh, and and it's looking great. I've got to say, I got the uh, I got the lettered coloured pages um, in. About oh, right. two, three weeks yeah, ago yeah. now for approval, That's um, and uh, signed off on them, and so they're off at the printers. And I did a three thousand word interview from mm. uh, for the uh, for the text pages in there, where I cover stuff that I don't cover today, and I cover stuff today that I didn't cover in yeah, that. So you're yeah. on you're on good ground there. Fantastic! Oh, I'll definitely, I'll definitely be in with that one. That's that's for sure. Yeah. I, I really well. Mm. Does, does it does it ever get old? The feeling of seeing your work in print realised or on screen? Is that, that no, never does. <laughs> no, no. It's 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 yeah. No, it's it, you know it's like you know it's it's the cherry on the yeah, cake yeah, as much yeah. as anything. Much as I enjoy the process, every now and again. Um, and I was uh, I, I had a little exchange with the producer mm. of um, Lockwood and Co. Oh, yeah. Rachel Pryor, executive producer, um, and this was before Netflix decided. Yeah, it's it's we like it. It's a success. We love it, but we're not doing any more. Mm. And it's and that's logic that's hard to yeah, to it fathom. Make but sense, does it? when it came out and when you saw the reception of it and how well it went down and how yeah. well it had turned out, uh, Rachel was buzzing with that. And I said. Um, a couple of those in the course of a career and you can say you've won at life <laughs> and she and she she fired back a message says you totally get it yeah. she said. <laughs> <laughs> so you you do need those you do need those little yeah. highs every now and again to yeah, make yeah, the re- yeah. put the rest of it in yeah. context mm. and and actually I, that, that's a good lead into the next question actually um talking about the the the, re, the reworking of of warrior's gate as a as a new target novel so i, th- I think mm. did, did did you say you'd had the idea to kind of rework it be- before then and it, it kind of all fell into place with what Target Books wanted or was it a pitch from them to you? The, I- the idea floated around mm. and, uh, and it, was, it was Gareth, Gareth Kavanagh again, who, who gave me the latest nudge. Prior to that, you know, Matt Hills had, uh, had held on to the, um, the envelope of cuttings for a mm. while but hadn't been able to actually you know, buckle down to it and so you know, he regretfully had to pass it back. Um, Gareth was going to do it, and he was the one who first approached Target, and Target were uh, were tied up at the mm. time with a bunch of new stuff that was coming out um, and couldn't consider it. And then last year, um, it crossed my mind, because in the meantime, BBC Audio said, well, if Target don't want it, we'll have yeah. it. So as a result of that, I actually you know, buckled down to it and, uh, and did the reassembly. Mm. And in fact, it, it's just as well I did, because... 
I knew stuff that you know other people wouldn't. So <laughs> yeah, where others might have struggled, I had a slightly yeah, easier yeah, job yeah. of it. But it and it it slotted back together, mm. you know, really nicely. Um, and John Colshaw did the uh, the audio reading for that, which was the next best thing to having yeah, Tom himself yeah. doing it. And John Leeson came in and did uh, did K nine. Mm. Excuse me one That's second right. while <coughs> take a sip, the throat's going dry there. <laughs> so John Leeson came in and did yeah. K nine and then of course I had you know, I had the reassembled book mm. there, so I thought, well in the meantime I'd also um <coughs> done a ten thousand word novella for BBC yeah. Audio on what happened to Romana straight mm. after Warrior's Gate. I thought, well it would be kinda nice to see that in print as well. So I pitched that to Target and said, look, I know a couple of years ago you weren't able to do this. Mm. Is it off the table now or are you still maybe open to it? And they came back and said, oh, we're very much mm, open to brilliant. it. Yeah. And I think they'd got the, um, uh, was, is it five novelizations they'd got lined up for the, yeah. f- it was the 50th anniversary of Target and the 60th yeah. of the show. And they added Warrior's Gate to the existing yeah, ones. Yeah. And... Um, and so I kind of, you know, I joined the parade when the parade was already up and running. <laughs> so, uh, so I sneaked in there. But, um, but now it, it, it turned out the timing was yeah, good. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm, I'm really happy with the way it's all turned out. I, th- I, th- I think it's really good. I, again, I, it's weird because I was, it's a long time since I read the original Warriors Gate novelization. So I'm reading this one. I'm thinking, well, it doesn't actually seem to be an awful lot of difference, really. You know, mm-hmm. uh, but there is. But it's. Because I, I, I was going to read the original one again, but mm. I thought, no, I just don't have time for that, right? To be honest, mm. to read two novels mm. back to back, right? Mm. But, um, mm. but I kind of dipped into a few bits. I thought, oh, okay, so that bit is actually slightly different. Mm. So it's, it's, for mm. me, it's, I think that actually is one of the best mm. kind of um, expansions where you don't see where the chains are. Everything just flows kind of nicely. And it, and it is very fluid. I mean, there's no chapter titles in there, which always kind of weirded me out mm. when, I, when I read it originally. Mm-hmm. And same with Terminus as well. But you don't worry about that. You just go with the story. The, mm. the storytelling and the writing is so it's so magnetic. You know, you just get pulled into the story. It's really immersive. So, what I would hate to do would be to invalidate anybody's original experience mm. of the uh, of the first novelization because you know you, you read these things at a certain stage in your life and they have an effect with yeah. you and they stay Mm, with you absolutely and for someone to come along and say oh you know the one that you loved all those years ago forget about that here's this (coughs) one instead (coughs) yeah i'm not (laughs) yeah yeah i'm not a big fan of of that kind Mm. of recutting you know i I went along to see um spielberg's uh revised version of close (coughs) close encounters Mm. and i thought oh why did you do this you know because it's not as good as the first time around so, so fortunately, he's he kind of reverted mm, on mm. that one, and uh, and I was able to get the Blu-ray of the original cut. But I wouldn't want to invalidate mm. the experience of Warriors Gate the first time around. So it's really nice that you couldn't immediately mm. see the differences because what I've really done is I've I've just kind of thickened and enhanced yeah, yeah. and um, and deepened certain yeah. stuff from the first time around that had to be kind of thinned out mm. um, and you didn't necessarily get full measure the first time you're just getting full measure of the same thing now yeah because I, I, I hope <laughs> well I, th- I think the word count requirement <laughs> on the old target novels was quite slim wasn't it I, I thought it was it yeah. must have been about 50,000 words something like that 50 ish so it's not I forget massive, precisely but I do know that Christine Doniger who was the editor mm. at WH Allen who were doing target at the time she actually got clearance because she'd she'd already signed off on the first version of the novelization oh, right. she was happy yeah. with it and she'd gone to the production department and says i need some extra pages for this and they'd agreed that so it was going to be you know a, a, a slightly mm-hmm. larger than than usual novelization and if you look at uh, the uh, the photographs that um, that target have put out of all the books put together warrior's gate is slightly yeah. yes. thicker yeah, than all the others <laughs> yeah. it is actually i can confirm that yeah. it's actually thicker mm. but then of course yeah. you've got the two short stories at the end of it as well mm. haven't you which um which are the you have you've got the the kairos ring you've got the novella yeah with uh, with romana mm. and laszlo and then you've got the um the short story at the end the little book of fate um, the little book mm. of fate with um the uh Oh God! Which doctor Eighth is it? Doctor. I, lose, I, I can never keep. <laughs> the f- yeah, I can never. I, I can never uh, keep track of the numbers. My, uh, the lovely thing yeah. about that is, I I went back and watched the 
the Doctor Who movie sure, yeah, again, yeah, yeah. Paul McGann movie, yeah, we watched again, didn't we? yeah which I'd yeah. seen once mm. when it went out, and and I I I thought oh oh all right then you know and moved yeah. on. Uh, obviously, nothing's going to come of this because it had already been decided that it wasn't mm. going to go forward. But going back to it, I thought, you know, this is yeah. bloody it's all right, good. isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, and every, everything that makes New mm. Who work it's is kind there. of in there yeah. in yes, embryo. Exactly, it's a lovely but, bridge between uh, the old uh, and the new, isn't it? Yeah, I mean that fantastic scene where the doctor's at the opera and yeah. um, and gets called in to uh, to revive the patient, mm. and you've got the um, <laughs> you you know you've got the opera music and the billowing dress as she yeah, races yeah. down the corridor. Oh, sort of turn oh, of the oh God Almighty! Well, isn't it? it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's dark. yeah, Jeffrey Sachs wasn't it? Very very creative direction. Some nice transitions. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's from, yeah. from that perspective. But also, I think the story, I think, is just so joyous. I mean, again, maybe originally yeah. when I first watched it, I thought, okay, it's, uh, wasn't quite mm. what I expected. But then you get over that, mm. and then you just enjoy it. And I think it's it's a lovely story. Yeah, it's really good. You do get the feel that everybody's having fun making exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which you, d- but in the, in right, the right way. way. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which you don't always get on Warriors Gate when you watch that. I think. I think you can sense some of the tensions. But, well, mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you sense it? <laughs> it, 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 it? There is a tension there, but it, it kind of adds to it because it's you know it's towards the end of mm. Tom Baker's run, and we got the whole foreshadowing mm. that Chris Bibmead I think mm. threaded throughout the whole of that mm. season, and it builds towards mm. that sort of tragic doom of the Fourth Doctor. It sounds very ground and everything else but it's 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 not the most fun story but there there is comedy in it so but you have to kind of pick at it isn't it but yeah yeah i mean i, I do feel the tension but then again i um i'm kind of also remembering what it was That's like thing, to be so in the studio yeah, while yeah. it was being made so it, it it's that tension as much as anything if not more than anything in the story mm. and a lot of it was going over my head i just knew <laughs> that there was you know <laughs> people were hissing at each other yeah. under the breath and i thought oh god yeah these people all hate <laughs> each other what's going on <laughs> nobody's having fun here <laughs> oh, dear. but you know what you've got innovative storytelling the, the style of doctor mm. who story that we hadn't really seen before yeah. and we've got some some mm. innovations from the production from the directorial point of view again i mean it's paul joyce fighting against the system them almost to to stamp a creative mm. um, vision on on the, on the piece that he feels it deserves mm. and getting and getting mm. knocked back for it you know like like you're saying with you you know writing a novel that does justice to the original story that you the, the concepts and everything else that you wanted to expand on and then getting knocked back by it as well mm. and it's probably yeah you know it's probably <laughs> easy to blame John Nathan Turner for mm. that but of course John is trying to straddle both ends isn't he he's trying to keep the creatives mm. happy and he yeah. he was a very creative mm. person from all perspectives and he's also mm trying to keep the corporate suits happy as well and him doing mm. so ends up being a target for everybody so you've yeah. got, to, got to feel yeah. for the guy that really oh yeah there's no way I'm going to uh, diss the guy mm. who gave me the gig in the first place <laughs> <laughs> no definitely not but so, so going back to these short stories then um, so what was the inspiration mm. for those you, did you just kind of had the idea that you wanted to write a sequel and again with the 8th Doctor thing was because the, the, I don't want to give too much away but it is a real mm. treat for 8th Doctor fans and of a certain time mm. in the modern series kind of mythology as well it kind of taps into that mm. but I will say no more but <laughs> uh, very good. <laughs> well, it was it was as simple as I was asked. Ah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Steve, can you write yeah, us up another <laughs> couple of chapters on this, mate? We got some space to fill, and you can string some words together, can't you? Was it like that? I was always I was always of the opinion yeah. that there was a missed opportunity with Romana and Laszlo to do the female Doctor Ooh. that everybody talked about for so yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There they were, uh, a Time Lord and a mm. companion, and the Gateway, which was essentially a yeah, TARDIS, yeah. you know, yeah. where you could access any point in space or time from it. Um, and there was your female Doctor from you know 1980, whatever it was mm. onwards. Uh, just waiting to be yeah. picked up. Never did anything with it until um, BBC Audio said, we're doing these 10,000 word novellas. Is there anything you would like to do? At which point I thought, well, that's a starting mm. point. What can I do with that? Where can I take it? And, you know, it's kind of a grit in the oyster kind of thing. Once somebody's kickstarted it, then you start to think, well, what story do I want to tell yeah. here? Where do I want it to go? What do I want it to be? I think I had a couple of fragments mm, mm. of um, what became the opening scenes of um, of the story that I'd I'd started to write and 
not gone anywhere with yeah. and it wasn't necessarily the Romana story that they were part of but I took that and I put it together with the uh, with the, the Romana mm. and Laszlo situation and then you know those two kind of fizzed together and, and started to generate more ideas so that became the Kairos ring and then um, Steve Cole said well you know we need something to um, something new unpublished yeah. un uncirculated to add he to the book just to give it that little bit of yeah, extra yeah, edge yeah. yeah and my first thought was well you know a linking story between the two mm. perhaps and then i thought well it doesn't need a linking story between the two um what does it need it needs rounding off and bringing up to mm. date so there were limitations on what i could do with other doctors right because of what had been you know and again not to get too far into spoiler territory um there were other doctors i could not use because of knowledge that the doctor in my okay. story needed yeah, to have yeah, yeah. Uh, that was not allowed him mm. in certain incarnations so that's why i went to the tv movie because you know that doctor stood apart from the others to a certain yeah, extent yeah, but yeah. of course he has now been drawn into the uh, the modern mm, mythology yeah. Um, so there are there are points of contact there. So what I did was I made a bridge between, you know, the um, the start of that and mm. the the point of contact with the modern mythology, uh, and that arc became, you yeah, know, what yeah, I yeah. what I tried to uh, to flesh out in that story. And as a result of you know wanting to do that, that's why I went back to the TV movie, and it was a, I'm, I was so pleased I did mm. that because I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have necessarily revisited mm. it otherwise and. Uh, and I'm so glad yeah, I we did. watched it again recently, didn't we, for a podcast mm. episode? It was yeah, great, did, great yeah. watching it again. It is so yeah. good, and uh, yeah, we hadn't seen mm. it in a while. Yeah, it's really mm. good. Mm. Um, we and McGann needs more oh, recognition yeah. oh, as well. Good. I know he's done the big yeah, finish yeah. stuff and that, but uh, yeah, it, was, it was really. And in fact, you know, when it came to uh, Chris mm. Chibnall leaving off and um, and you know the reboot, my thought would have been, um, what would my thought have been? <laughs> no, I did have an idea for. <laughs> no. I haven't thought this through, and I'm not going to no, give it away. Right, yeah. so. Hold on, <laughs> no, actually, on, on that the, the, yeah. the last Doctor Who episode, the the power of the Doctor, Jodie Whittaker's mm. final story. I mean, it yeah. was such a joy to see yeah. all the old, all, as many of the old Doctors back in that as they could, yeah. and, and the Eighth Doctor, mm. Paul McGann, joining the, the setup as yeah. well. You know, that it was, was it was a. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was an absolute. Because on the one hand, I was um, I, I was gutted mm. when they didn't take the Eighth Doctor stories further. You know, and, it was, and you're mm. right. It, the, the doom bell had already mm. told before we even saw the episode. Mm. I think, and and, mm. and and on the other hand, I was actually kind of pleased as well because what looks like the kind of storyline or the direction we we're going to go in, just I didn't think I was going to really engage with. It. I thought that's uh, that's a bit bit too mm. weird. But of course, it sparked mm. off. You know, like you said, everything that the modern series has began in, is there in embryonic form. So if we mm. maybe hadn't had that, would we have had the revival? Because obviously in the UK. The Doctor Who movie was reasonably mm. successful, wasn't it? So you know they realised that there was there, there was an, an audience still hungry for it and a new mm. audience to be gained from it. Yeah. And actually, going back to um, yeah. back to your story, that that final short story in, in Warriors Gate, the the little book of fate, in you know is 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 such a fabulous bridge because happening where it does and using Romana and Laszlo and the Doctor from from the from the old series. So you've got. You know that classic era, the, the end of the fourth Doctor series, bridging nicely with mm. with the eighth Doctor, and then of course into the new series as well. So I think anyone, any any new new fan, I say new fan, they're probably all in their twenties and thirties now, actually thinking about it, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah. for those who've only really engaged with the modern mm. series, I would say go and visit this because you will be delighted not only by the main story, Warriors Gate, because it is a fabulous read and the, the the two short stories but it's almost like the cherry on the cake is that last short story the the little book of fate which just gives it just gives it an extra ping we need a sound effect jeff a little ping, yeah, yeah. a little golden light you know what i mean it's just it's brilliantly done and congratulations Stephen, and thank you for bringing that to us i i wish well thank you very much and your money's behind the radiator in nice the one <laughs> lovely uh, i am um, i haven't been able to read it yet we only got sent one copy of each book didn't we and so, it's mine oh. i'm holding on to it it's right there. and there it stays jeff yeah. we, we had, oh, i'm so sorry <laughs> we, we had a fight over who got which ones <laughs> yeah we did and i'm like i'm bagsy worries going yeah. i'm over that yeah, one that's, yeah. that's what paul takes so, yeah i do um, do that yeah. we've got a question here from um, ian banks on twitter 
who says you've mm. enjoyed a successful career across multiple media, radio, TV, novels, comics and audio. Um, and he says he's read a few of your novels and, and really enjoyed them, so thank you for that. Has Doctor Who been a help or a hindrance for you in terms of your recognition as a writer? Ooh. Oh, thank you for that, Ian. Um, it's, I can only say it's been a help. I mean, you know, it's um, it's it's even more of a help mm. now, now that Doctor Who has a more stellar reputation than it did back mm. in the early days. Um, there was a tendency for people to think of me as, you know, my television experience was as a writer on a kid's show. <laughs> um, I didn't write for TV again for several years. Uh, I did a an episode of a cop show called Rockcliffe's Folly. I remember Folly, that, yeah. Which, which worked quite well. Yeah, it was a spin-off of Rockcliffe's mm. Babies. Um, but that was just a, a kind of one-off freelance gig. Not r- very much in my in my wheelhouse, really, but it was... It was a chance to show that I could do it professionally to order, you yeah. know, to um, to a series concept. Things didn't really work out for me until in in TV until I sold Chimera to uh, TV, right. yeah, and um, and that uh, as a four parter based on a novel, with my fingerprints all over mm. it from start to finish, was um, was a, it kind of reset the um, it reset the right. dial, uh, and that's the thing that kind of. You know, yeah. perfused the character of my uh, my career from that point onwards, and then you know as time went on, then people would pop up and and say, "Oh God, what this was mainly after um, it was possible to get you know, home versions of it, you know, VHS mm. first, then DVD, and people started rediscovering it, and then I became not only the Chimera guy but the Chimera guy who had once worked on oh, Doctor right. Who." And that was kind of, you know, just um, an added flavour to the whole thing that was really satisfying for me because, you know, everything I've done, I own. People would come up to me at um, Easter cons and uh, they'd have a copy of Saturn 3, which is a a thing that I novelised in 1979 Mm. during the ITV strike when uh, when I was on strike and needed money. (laughs) So I'd I'd, I'd novelised... I'd novelised the script that was nominally Martin Amis's, but mm. apparently everybody, every screenwriter in town had taken a swing at it, <laughs> including Frederick Raphael at really? one point, apparently. So, um, and they come up and they expect, uh, oh, you know, I've caught you out. Here's, uh, will you blush? Oh, no, I'll sign you up, mate, no yeah, problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Don't think you're going to embarrass me with it. <laughs> Steve, did you ever meet anyone and you told them that you'd written Warrior's Gate and they'd say, but it was written by... You know, Paul, and and they, you know, they didn't didn't believe you. No, it's never, ne- never, no, really. No, I think <laughs> a jo- the a thing John, is, sorry, John Lydon, yeah, John Lydon, yeah, yeah, John, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. right, right, yeah. No, I, I, I get offered the book to sign sometime, and I always sign it twice. You know, once as ah. uh, as as me, and once <laughs> as John. Right. And uh, then, you're... if anybody's got copies of both novelizations, it's Steve, and then John, and then John, and then Steve. <laughs> That makes are sense, they different it? different signatures? <laughs> um, well, different names, Jeff. Obviously. <laughs> well, yeah, but is that style on on John's different? Uh, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've got a glass paperweight. So it's, it's actually downstairs somewhere. But uh, a glass paperweight that my sister-in-law had made for me as a birthday present one time, and it's the John Lydecker Excellent. signature. <laughs> um, sort of engraved in the glass so uh, in case I ever forget how to do it <laughs> you need to get a stamp for it yeah yeah just just yeah. do that so so last few questions then so I, I I can't let you go Steve without talking very very briefly about about Terminus which again actually mm. I, I I really like and I and I another mm. novelization that that, that I love because it just flows so your experience in that because was it better or worse different because you obviously went back to Doctor Who so what was your in a nutshell what was your experience writing that one it was it was different um, I'd had a big whinge at John Nathan <laughs> Turner after uh, after the, the whole yeah. Warriors Gate thing because uh, and my agent said <laughs> I wish you'd shown that to me before because I would have stopped oh. you <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but you know J- John's response to that was to uh, was to commission mm. me for Terminus you know say we'll we'll take another one uh, in the meantime Chris left and Eric mm. Saywood came in as uh, a script editor so I was dealing with a new team there Mary Ridge's uh, director yeah. um and it was a more standard mm. Doctor Who experience it wasn't as chaotic as Warrior's Gate um 
I was just as fond of the material and just as um, you know, I, I delved into Norse yeah, mythology yeah, yeah. and you know, and various uh, you know, various other fields of research and stole from medieval uh, manuscripts and um, you know other visual sources as well and also saw the production team take up um, all my suggestions and take it in their own creative mm, direction mm. so from that point of view it was a wholly satisfying experience it didn't make the mark that mm. Warriors Gate made and it's not as beloved by fans as Warriors Gate is but I do have to say that when you find somebody who mm. does um, rate Terminus, they tend to rate it quite yeah, highly. Yeah. And and I've had the experience a couple of mm. times now of overhearing conversations where people didn't know I was in the room or didn't know who <laughs> I was. Weren't even necessarily talking about Doctor yeah. Who, but they were talking about horror. And Terminus came up as their example of go-to horror for oh, TV. Oh, really? That's oh, interesting, that's really isn't it? Yeah. 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 That's um yeah. yeah. And uh and that is very gratifying mm. because it means that the the volume of noise, you know, is is great, but the specificity specificity, specificity. of of that appreciation. Yeah. 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 Do you ever do you ever start a I word? Wish you yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite often. <laughs> Halfway through, you realise it's not going to come out the way you yeah, wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah I think, but that's just as gratifying yeah, in its yeah. way. I, I think Terminus has got a lot going for him. And as I said, I mean, uh, the only thing I really don't like is is the cover, that particular cover. But again, it has a certain, you know, because I bought it at a certain time in my life, and if they changed it, mm. I know there are different covers, but it's it, it still mm. means something. But I, I mm. the TV show itself, there there is a lot to love. I mean, what, uh, I know it's mm. not necessarily your decision, but I love the music on it. I can't remember who did it, whether mm. it's Roger Limor or somebody yeah. else. But it sounds very Vangelis like, you know. It's, it, it is mm. almost see, almost sounds to me like it's taking its inspiration from from something like Blade Runner, mm. for example. You know, as those kind of soaring synthesized mm. strings, kind of one note, sort of up and down on the, you know, I, and, and I love it. And and it and it has the whole thing has a has a has an atmosphere to it you know which is which is very i'm, I'm trying not to say cold because it's not cold it's mm. full of character and it's full of personality mm. but it's cold in the sense that it's mm. the the environment is is sterile in a, you know because it is like a mm. hospital ship type thing isn't it or it's but it's not mm. quite that it's it's mm. th there's there's something really unsettling about terminus actually <laughs> that's what i'm getting at it's that's the word unsettling mm. which is always <laughs> there every time i watch it and every time i read the novel it's like you know it's it's yeah i i can't describe it i don't have the vocabulary to describe it to my shame but <laughs> It's there's something about it that is very creepy. <laughs> well, you've got you've got this this large empty ship, yeah. or, or apparently empty ship, and then on the other side of the skull doors, you've got this incredibly dark Narnia mm. of uh, of Ooh, suffering. And and, yeah. and I I do remember when uh, when the show was going out after the first episode, there was a letter in the Radio mm. Times from the British Leprosy Association saying, you know, you're giving leprosy a bad name. It's, we 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 fight all the time to um to oh, to kind of dispel yeah. the myths. And the thing is if you go through to the end that's what the show mm. is about. You know, the fact that here is an entirely curable disease yeah. that is stigmatized mm. for other purposes. Um and you know Nissa stays behind mm. in order to do the work kind of in parallel to what the British Leprosy Society yeah, were doing yeah. but I uh, yeah they, they jumped the gun on that Knee -jerk one joke reaction yeah without, without yeah. sort of looking at it can't blame them but uh, <laughs> I, I wish they'd let me answer it though because mm. John John Nathan Turner you know said oh we're just trying to make entertainment mm. um, in in, uh, no, actually, John, you know, something's yeah, said, isn't it? That, yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes, actually, when when those questions are kind of raised, it, it's it's good to open the discussion rather than just shut it down, isn't mm -hmm. it? I think, it, you know, it's and you know, to, to open those questions via mm -hmm. a TV show that you know, popular TV show that yeah. everybody engages with and loves is, uh, is is a good way to do it. You know, the modern series does that quite well, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's sad in a way that it was seen as all like shameful or misunderstood. It was at a time when, uh, yeah, um, it was it was a show that was not taken seriously, mm. and there was the joke about the wobbly sets and everything. And I've always said that, you know, 
people did not love Doctor Who for its wobbly sets. They loved it despite yeah. them. And we, we love the stories. I, I think yeah, that, that's, that's it. That's yeah, it you, you can look past any wobbles and, mm. you know, you, you mm. can't judge the effects of the old stories by modern yeah. standards, you know, but you have to look at them for what they were doing for the story and what they were telling of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Kids these days, eh? <laughs> no idea. Yeah. So let's go to our, <laughs> to our final question from the Twitterverse then. So we got Paul Schoons, mm. at Paul Schoons, asks, is there any chance we might see a, novel- a novelization of your scripts for the unmade season 21 story, The Nightmare Country? What do you reckon, Steve? Well, hello, Paul. And it's it's never, never arisen. Um, and I haven't been asked. Oh. And I suppose were I asked, I'd certainly consider it, but it's not something that I'm agitating to do it was it was really really nice to be able to do mm. the nightmare country yeah, the, the bit, um, after all the these years because that right. was the yeah it was the pitch that i um i put in after terminus and that um that eric eric say would responded to with it's another million dollar movie and we just can't <laughs> do them and, <laughs> and it, yeah he was entirely right it, it is a million dollar movie yeah. but you can do a million dollar movie yeah, for yeah. audio exactly. so yeah. uh the lovely thing is that I got the cast that I uh, I would have mm. had the first time round. Um, same people, you know, same voices, yeah. um, same story, and I had I'd broken the story right into um, scenes and almost taken it as far as just writing the dialogue. Mm. So mm. I had very little to do to take it from um, the the treatment that had been rejected all those years ago to um, to the the audio version. And um, and it was it was great fun to do. Whether I would have anything more to say on the story that I could add in a novelization, or whether it would mm. just be rather a case of adding visuals yeah. and um, and adding a bit more vision, uh, I don't know. Um, but as I say, it's not necessarily on the cards, and I don't see it immediately being on the cards anywhere in the near future. Mm. You, you never know. Never you never know. I, I kind of think it would probably be a publishing decision, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, if they decided they wanted to yeah, go do into the lost that. stories. As lost stories. As, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 If if you got asked, would you write for a modern Doctor Who? Um, it would. Be, yeah, I'm sure I would. I'm sure I would. I mean, I haven't attempted mm. to, and I haven't applied to, and I haven't agitated <laughs> to, because because <laughs> yeah. yeah Modern Doctor Who, you don't go to them; yeah, they come yeah. to you. And you know, I've always said, if you um, if you go to them and the answer's no, then it's an awfully long walk back <laughs> to your seat. <laughs> Unless nobody knows that you are so nervous. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. We, I think we were talking. Well, I will know. You well, know, as, yeah, exactly. as an old Who yeah, hand, yeah. you know, it's different. It, you know, where I am, a, a new writer looking to break mm. in and and looking to kind of escalate, then that would be different. It would be worth having a go. And, and getting knocked back but you know honestly I've not got an idea to take mm. to them if I had an overwhelming idea then you know then there would be a, some conflict over that as to you know what do I do what do I do with yeah. it um, but I don't I don't and uh, what happened with the um, you know with the Kairos mm. ring and with the little book of fate was that I got kick started somebody put a spark yeah. in and, and set me off uh, and without that spark, I, I don't know that I would have returned mm-hmm. to the uh, the world at all. But, you know, with the spark, yeah, yeah. yeah. there Sometimes we go. That's all it needs, yeah, it? If, any, if anyone's listening, and they've, well, we know there will be people listening, and they've got an idea for, for Stephen, uh, you know, <laughs> tweet, sparking. Yeah, tweet yes. it. Tweet <laughs> strike that yeah. flint together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so what are you working mm-hmm. on now? What have we got lined up for the future? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on um, a movie for a German producer. Um, which is one of those uh, things that, uh, again, got stalled by COVID mm. and has reawakened itself. Uh, we've got Faustine coming out in a few yeah. weeks, and we are talking about maybe doing more in the comics world because I really enjoyed writing a comic script. Did you? Because yeah. it was, yeah, it was two weeks of intensive mm. work and then a year of watching the artist do all the hard <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and, it, and it's Martin Garrity who's kind of, you know... Doctor yeah, Who royalty he's, he's, in the comics good, world, and and he's done a mm. terrific job, and um, and yeah, we'll all see that soon. But yeah, I I would be quite keen to do a little bit more in that area because it's a field that I'd not done anything in yeah, before. Yeah. So you know, it was just another uh, another part of the toy shop yeah. to play in. Yeah. You know, I'd it's brilliant. Yeah, and and the other thing is, uh, you know, that that 
nine-year-old mm. project that I mentioned before, which has raised its head again. We're having a, a Zoom meeting on that next oh. week with uh, with the New Zealand end. That's exciting. Which is where Paul Schoons is at the oh, moment. Indeed. So, so that all ties <laughs> together quite nicely. So might, be able, might be able to see him soon. You never know. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, Stephen, thank you so, so much for, for joining yeah, us. Thank you. I, you know, it's, it's a, it feels like it's been a real privilege and an honour to, to have a chat with you in person. And thank you in person as well for, for coming out with Boris Gate and, and, as I said, boosting my engagement with the Doctor Who show. The Doctor Who show. Doctor Who as a programme. <laughs> you know, it's, it was really quite formative for me. So it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for your time and good luck on all your, all your projects. Yeah. Oh, it's been great fun. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been brilliant. You're very welcome. Listeners, join us uh, very soon for another episode of Who Corner to Corner. In the meantime, make sure you do go out and grab yourself a copy of Warrior's Gate and Beyond by Steve Gallagher yeah, and, of I, course, all the other Target novels because Target novels are, quite frankly, brilliant. And yeah. if you don't buy them, then there's something wrong with you. And anyway, there you go. So that. <laughs> I believe they're all out on July 13th. So by the time this one comes out that will be in probably yes two two weeks after this episode comes out there you so go. perfect perfect timing to head over to your favorite bookstore and get your order in or even so. your non-favorite bookstore you oh, yeah you could do that bookstore you hate doesn't yeah. matter you know. mix, mix i hate this bookstore but i want that book yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mix it up Brilliant. a bit Brilliant. thank you listeners Thanks, we will see you again bye. next time bye for now bye.